preface by will carton read for LibriVox.org. these poems have been written under various and in some cases difficult conditions in the open air with tim field in the student's den with the ghosts of unfinished lessons hovering gloomily about amid the rush and roar of railroad travel which trains of thought are not prone to follow and in the editor's sanctum where the dainting feet of the muse do not often deign to tread crude and unfinished as they are the author has yet had the assurance to publish them from time to time in different periodicals in which it is but just to admit they have been met by the people with unexpected favor while his judgment has often failed to endorse the kind words spoken for them he has naturally not felt it in his heart to file any remonstrances he has been asked by friends in all parts of the country to put his poems into a more durable form than they have hitherto possessed and it is in accordance with these requests that he now presents farm ballads to the public of course he does not expect to escape what he needs so greatly the discipline of severe criticism for he is aware that he has often wandered out of the beaten track and has many times been too regardless of the established rules of rhythm in his oftentimes vain search for the flowers of poesy but he believes that the people are after all the true critics and will soon ascertain whether there are more good than poor things in a book and whatever may be their verdict in this case he has made up his mind to be happy w c to my mother end of preface this recording is in the public domain betsy and i are out by william carlton read for LibriVox.org by robert robinson draw up the papers lawyer and make em good and stout for things at home are crossways, and Betsy and I are out. We, who have worked together so long as man and wife, must pull in single harness for the rest of our natural life. What's the matter, say you? I swain it's hard to tell. Most of the years behind us we've passed by very well. I have no other woman, she has no other man. Only we've lived together as long as we ever can. So I have talked with Betsy, and Betsy has talked with me, and so we've agreed together that we can't never agree. Not that we've catched each other in any terrible crime. We've been a-gathering this for years, a little at a time. There was a stock of temper we both had for a start, although we never suspected twould take us two apart. I had my various failings, bred in the flesh and bone, and Betsy, like all good women, had a temper of her own. The first thing I remember whereupon we disagreed was something concerning heaven, a difference in our creed. We argued the thing at breakfast, we argued the thing at tea, and the more we argued the question, the more we didn't agree. And the next that I remember was when we lost a cow. She had kicked the bucket for certain, the question was only, how? I held my opinion, and Betsy another had, and when we were done a-talking, we both of us was mad. And the next that I remember, it started in a joke, but full for a week it lasted, and neither of us spoke. And the next was when I scolded because she broke a bowl, and she said I was mean and stingy and hadn't any soul. And so that bowl kept pouring dissensions in our cup, and so that blamed cow critter was always a coming up. And so that heaven we argued no nearer to us got, but it gave us a taste of something a thousand times as hot. And so the thing kept working, in all the self-same way, always something to argue and something sharp to say and down on us came the neighbors a couple dozen strong 
and lent their kindest sarvice for to help a thing along. And there has been days together, and many a weary week, we was both of us cross and spunky, and both too proud to speak. And I have been thinking and thinking, the whole of the winter and fall, if I can't live kind with a woman, why, then I won't at all. And so I have talked with Betsy, and Betsy has talked with me, and we have agreed together that we can't never agree. And what is hers shall be hers, and what is mine shall be mine, and I'll put that in the agreement and take it to her to sign. Write on the paper, lawyer, the very first paragraph of all the farm and livestock that she shall have her half, for she has helped to earn it through many a weary day, and it's nothing more than justice that Betsy has her pay. Give her the house and homestead. A man can thrive in Rome, but women are skeery creatures unless they have a home. And I have always determined, and never failed to say, that Betsy should never want a home if I was taken away. There is a little hard money that's drawing tolerable pay, a couple of hundred dollars laid by for a rainy day. Safe in the hands of good men and easy to get at, put in another clause there and give her half of that. Yes, I see you smile, sir, and my giving her so much. Yes, divorce is cheap, sir, but I take no stock in such. True and fair, I married her, and when she was blithe and young, and Betsy was always good to me, excepting with her tongue. Once when I was young as you, and not so smart perhaps, for me she mittened a lawyer and several other chaps. All of them was flustered and fairly taken down, and I for a time was counted the luckiest man in town. Once when I had a fever, I won't forget it soon, I was hot as basted turkey and crazy as a loon. Never an hour went by when she was out of sight. She nursed me true and tender and stuck to me day and night. And if ever a house was tidy, and ever a kitchen clean, her house and kitchen was tidy as I have ever seen. And I don't complain of Betsy, or any of her acts, exceptin' when we quarreled, and told each other facts. So draw up the paper, Laura, and I'll go home tonight, and read the agreement to her, and see if it's all right. And then, in the morning, I'll sell to a trading man I know, and kiss the child that was left to us, and out in the world I'll go. And one thing put in the paper that first to me didn't occur, that when I am dead at last she'll bring me back to her and lay me under the maples I planted years ago when she and I was happy before we quarreled so. And when she dies I wish that she would be laid by me and, lying together in silence, perhaps we will agree. And if ever we meet in heaven, I wouldn't think it queer if we loved each other the better because we quarreled here. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. How Betsy and I Made Up by Will Carleton Read for LibriVox.org by Robert Robinson Give us your hand, Mr. Lawyer. How do you do today? You drew up that paper. I suppose you want your pay. Don't cut down your figures. Make it an X or a V, for that there written agreement was just the making of me. Going home that evening, I'll tell you I was blue, thinking of all my troubles and what I was going to do. And if my hosses hadn't been the steadiest team alive, they'd tip me over certain, for I couldn't see where to drive. No, for I was laboring under a heavy load. No, for I was traveling an entirely different road. For I was a-tracing over the path of our lives again and seeing where we missed the way, and where we might have been. And many a corner we'd turned that just to a quarrel led, when I ought to have held my temper and driven straight ahead. And the more I thought it over, the more these memories came, and the more I struck the opinion that I was most to blame. And things I had long forgotten kept rising in my mind, of little matters betwixt us, where Betsy was good and kind. And these things flashed all through me, as you know things sometimes will when a fellow's alone in the darkness and everything is still. But, says I, we're too far along to take another track, and when I put my hand to the plow I do not oft turn back, and taint none a common thing now for couples to smash in two. And so I set my teeth together, and I vowed I'd see it through. When I come inside of the house, t'was some at in the night, 
and just as I turn the hilltop I see the kitchen light, which often a handsome picture to a hungry person makes, but it don't interest a feller much that's going to pull up stakes. And when I went in the house, the table was set for me, as good a supper's I ever saw, or ever want to see. And I crammed the agreement down my pocket, as well as I could, and fell to eating my victuals, which somehow didn't taste good. And Betsy, she pretended to look about the house, but she watched my side coat pocket like a cow would watch a mouse. And then she went a-fooling a little with her cup, and intently reading a newspaper, a holding it wrong side up. And when I'd done my supper, I drawed the agreement out, and gave it to her without a word, for she knowed what t'was about. And then I hummed a little tune, but now and then a note was busted by some animal that hopped up in my throat. Then Betsy, she got her specs from off the mantel shelf, and read the article over quite softly to herself. Read it little by little, for her eyes is getting old, and you know, lawyers writing ain't no print, especially when it's cold. And after she'd read a little, she gave my arm a touch, and kindly said she was afraid I was lowing her too much. But when she was through, she went for me, her face is streaming with tears, and kissed me for the first time in over twenty years. I don't know what you'll think, sir, I didn't come to inquire, but I picked up that agreement and stuffed it in the fire. And I told her we'd bury the hatchet alongside of the cow, and we struck an agreement never to have another row. And I told her in the future I wouldn't speak cross or rash if half the crockery in the house was broken all to smash. And she said, in regards to heaven, we'd try and learn its worth by starting a branch establishment and running it here on earth. And so we sat a talk in three quarters of the night and opened our hearts to each other until they both grew light. And the days when I was winning her away from so many men was nothing to that evening I courted her over again. Next morning, an ancient virgin took pains to call on us, her lamp all trimmed and a-burning to kindle another fuss. But when she went to prying and opening of old sores, my Betsy rose politely and showed her out of doors. Since then, I don't deny, but there's been a word or two. But we've got our eyes wide open and know just what to do. When one speaks cross, the other just meets it with a laugh, and the first one's ready to give up considerable more than half. Maybe you'll think me soft, sir, a-talkin' in this style, but somehow it does me lots of good to tell it once in a while, and I do it for a compliment, tis so that you can see that that there written agreement of yours was just the makin' of me. So make out your bill, Mr. Lawyer. Don't stop short of an X. Make it more if you want to, for I have got the checks. I'm richer than a national bank with all its treasures told, for I've got a wife at home now that's worth her weight in gold. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gone with a Handsomer Man by Will Carlton Read for LibriVox.org by Kim Gibbs and Robert Robinson. I've worked the field all day, a plowin' the stony streak. I've scolded my team till I'm hoarse. I've trampled till my legs are weak. I've choked a dozen swears, so as not to tell Jane fibs, when the plow pent struck a stone and the handles punched my ribs. I put my team in the barn and rubbed their sweaty coats, and I fed them a heap of hay and half a bushel of oats. And to see the way they eat makes me like eatin' feel, and Jane won't say tonight that I don't make out a meal. Well said, the door is locked, but here she's left the key, under the step in a place known only to her and me. I wonder who's dying or dead, that she's hustled off pell-mell. Ah, oh, but here's on the table the note, and probably this will tell. Good God! My wife is gone! My wife has gone astray! The letter, it says, Goodbye, for I'm going away. I've lived with you for six months, John, and so far I've been true. But I'm going away today with a handsomer man than you. A handsomer man than me? Why, that ain't much to say. There's handsomer men than me go past here every day. There's handsomer men than me. I ain't of the handsome kind. But a lovinger man than I was, I guess you'll never find. Curse her! 
Curse her, I say, and give my curses wings. May the words of love I've spoken be changed to scorpion stings. Oh, she filled my heart with joy. She emptied my heart of doubt. And now, with a scratch of a pen, she lets my heart's blood out. Curse her, curse her, say I. She'll sometime rue this day. She'll sometime learn that hate is a game that two can play. And long before she dies, she'll grieve she ever was born. And I'll plow her grave with hate and seat it down to scorn. As soon as the world goes on, there'll come a time when she will read the devilish heart of that handsomer man than me. And there'll be a time when he will find, as others do, that she who is false to one can be the same with two. And when her face grows pale, and when her eyes grow dim, and when she is tired of her and she is tired of him, she'll do what she ought to have done, and coolly count the cost, and then she'll see things clear, and know what she has lost. And thoughts that are now asleep will wake up in her mind, and she will mourn and cry for what she has left behind, and maybe she'll sometimes long for me, for me, but no, I've blotted her out of my heart, and I will not have it so. And yet in her girlish heart there was something or other she had that fastened a man to her and wasn't entirely bad. And she loved me a little, I think, although it didn't last. But I mustn't think of these things. I've buried them in the past. I'll take my hard words back, nor make bad matter worse. She'll have trouble enough. She shall not have my curse. But I'll live a life so square and well know that I can that she always will sorry be that she went with that handsomer man. And here is her kitchen dress. It makes my poor eyes blur. It seems, when I look at that, as if t'was holding her. And here are her weekday shoes, and there is a weekday hat. And yonder, her wedding gown. I wonder she didn't take that. T'was only this morning she came and called me her dearest dear, and said I was making for her a regular paradise here. Oh God, if you want a man to sense the pains of hell, before you pitch him in, just keep him in heaven a spell. Goodbye. I wish that death had severed us two apart. You've lost a worshiper here. You've crushed a loving heart. I'll worship no woman again, but I guess I'll learn to pray and kneel as you used to kneel before you run away. And if I thought I could bring my words on heaven to bear, and if I thought I had some little influence there, I would pray that I might be, if it only could be so, as happy and gay as I was a half an hour ago. Why, John, what a litter here. You've thrown things all around. Come, what's the matter now? And what have you lost or found? And here's my father here, a-waitin' for supper, too. I've been a-ridin' with him. He's that handsomer man than you. Ha, 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 pa, take a seat while I put the kettle on and get things ready for tea and kiss my dear old John. Why, John, you look so strange. Come, what has crossed your track? I was only a joking, you know. I'm willing to take it back. Well now, if this ain't a joke, with rather a bitter cream, it seems as if I'd woke from a mighty ticklish dream, and I think she smells a rat, for she smiles at me so queer. I hope she don't, good Lord. I hope that they didn't hear "'Twas one of her practical drives. "'She thought I'd understand. "'But I'll never break sod again "'till I get the lay of the land. "'But one thing's settled with me, "'to appreciate heaven well. "'Tis good for a man to have some fifteen minutes of hell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Johnny Rich by Will Carlton, read for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. Raise the light a little, Jim, for it's getting rather dim, and with such a storm a howling, twill not do to douse the glim. Hustle down the curtains, Lou, poke the fire a little, Sue. This is something of a flurry, mother, something of a phew. Goodness gracious, how it pours! How it beats against the doors. You will have a hard one, Jimmy, when you go to do the chores. Do not overfeed the gray. Give a plenty to the bay. And be careful with your lantern when you go among the hay. 
See, the horses have a bed when you've got them fairly fed. Feed the cows that's in the stable, and the sheep that's in the shed. Give the spotted cow some meal, where the brindle cannot steal, for she's greedy as a porker, and as slippery as an eel. Hang your lantern by the ring, on a nail, or on a string, for the Durham carful bump it, if there's any such a thing. He's a handsome one to see, and a knowing one is he. I stooped over to the morning, and he up and went for me. Rover thinks he hears a noise. Just keep still a minute, boys. Nelly, hold your tongue a second, and be silent with your toys. Stop that bark now, you whelp, or I'll kick you till you yelp. Yes, I hear it. Tis somebody that's calling out for help. Get the lantern, Jim and Tom. Mother, keep the babies calm, and we'll follow up that hollow, and we'll see where it is from. Tis a hairy sort of night for a man to face and fight. And the wind is blown. Hang it, Jimmy, bring another light. Ah, twas you then, Johnny Rich, yelling out at such a pitch for a decent man to help you while you fell into the ditch. Tisn't quite the thing to say, but we ought to've let you lay, while your drunken carcass died a drinking water anyway. And to see you on my floor, and to hear the way you snore. Now we've lugged you under shelter, and the danger is all o'er. And you lie there quite resigned, whiskey deaf and whiskey blind. And it will not hurt your feelings, so I guess I'll free my mind. Do you mind, you thieving dunce, how you robbed my orchard once? Taking all the biggest apples, leaving all the little strunts? Do you mind my melon patch, how you gobbled the whole batch? Stacked the vines and sliced the greenest melons just to raise the scratch? Do you think, you drunken wag, it was anything to brag? To be cornered in my henroos with two pullets in a bag? You are used to dirty dens. You have often slept in pens. I've a mind to take you out there now and roost you with the hens. Do you call to mind with me how one night you and your three took my wagon all to pieces for to hang it on a tree? How you hung it up, you eels, straight and steady by the wheels? I've a mind to take you out there now and hang you by your heels. Now the fourth of last July, when you got a little high, you went back to Wilson's counter when you thought he wasn't nigh. How he heard some specie chink, and was on you in a wink. And you promised, if he'd hush it, that you never more would drink. Do you mind our temperance hall? How you're always sure to call, and recount your reformation with the biggest speech of all? How you talk, and how you sing, that the pledge is just the thing, how you sign it every winter, and then smash it every spring? Do you mind how Jenny Green was as happy as a queen when you walked with her on Sunday, looking sober, straight and clean? How she cried out half her sight when you staggered by next night, twice as dirty as a serpent? and a hundred times as tight. How our hearts with pleasure warmed when your mother, though it stormed, run up here one day to tell us that you truly had reformed. How that very self-same day, when upon her homeward way she run on you where you'd hidden full three-quarters o'er the bay, Oh, you little whiskey keg! Oh, you 
horrid little egg you're going to distraction with your swiftest foot and leg i've a mind to take you out underneath the water spout just to rinse you up a little so you'll know what you're about but you've got a handsome eye and although i can't tell why something somewhere in you always lets you get another try so for all that i have said i'll not douse you but instead i will strip you i will rub you i will put you into bed end of poem this recording is in the public domain Out of the Old House, Nancy, by Will Carleton, read for LibriVox.org, by Robert Robinson. Out of the Old House, Nancy, moved up into the new. All the hurry and worry is just as good as through, and that's to stand on the doorstep here and bid the old house goodbye. What a shell we've lived in these nineteen or twenty years. Wonder it hadn't smashed in and tumbled about our ears. Wonder it's stuck together and answered till today, but every individual log was put up here to stay. Things looked rather new, though, when this old house was built, and things that blossomed you would have made some women will. And every other day, then, as sure as day would break, my neighbor Ager would come this way, inviting me to shake. And you, for want of neighbors, was sometimes blue and sad, for wolves and bears and wildcats was the nearest ones you had. But looking ahead to the clearin', we worked with all our might, until we was fairly out of the woods, and things was going right. Look up there at our new house, ain't it a thing to see, tall and big and handsome, and new as new can be, all in apple pie order, especially the shelves, and never a debt to say, but we own it all ourselves. Look at our old log house, how little it now appears but it's never gone back on us for nineteen or twenty years. And I won't go back on it now, or go to poking fun. There's such a thing as praising a thing for the good that it has done. Probably you remember how rich we was that night, when we was fairly settled and had things snug and tight. We feel as proud as you please, Nancy, over our house that's new, but we felt as proud under this old roof, and a good deal prouder, too. Never a handsomer house was seen beneath the sun, kitchen and parlor and bedroom, we had them all in one, and the fat old wooden clock that we bought when we come west was ticking away in the corner there and doing its level best. Trees was all around us, a whispering, cheering words. Loud was the squirrel's chatter, and sweet the songs of birds. And home grew sweeter and brighter, our courage began to mount, and things looked hearty and happy then, and work appeared to count. And here one night it happened, when things was going bad, we fell into a deep old quarrel, the first we ever had. And when you give out and cried, and I, like a fool, give in, and then we agreed to rub all out and start the thing again. Here it was, you remember, we sat when the day was done, and you was making clothing that wasn't for either one. And often in a soft word of love I was soft enough to say, and the wolves was howling in the woods not twenty rods away. Then, our first-born baby, a regular little joy, though I fretted a little because it wasn't a boy. Wasn't she a little flirt, though, with all her pouts and smiles? Why, settlers come to see that show half a dozen miles. Yonder sat the cradle, a homely, homemade thing, and many a night I rocked it, providing you would sing. And many a little squatter brought up with us to stay, and so that cradle, for many a year, was never put away. How they kept a comin', so cunnin' and fat and small, how they growed, tis a wonder how we found room for em all. But though the house was crowded, it empty seemed that day when Jenny lay by the fireplace there and moaned her life away. And right in there the preacher, with Bible and hymn books, stood, twixt the dead and the living, and hoped would do us good. And the little white wood coffin on the table there was set. And now, as I rub my eyes, it seems if I could see it yet. Then, that fit of sickness it brought on you, you know, just by a thread you hung. 
and you e'en almost let go. And here is the spot I tumbled, and give the Lord his due, when the doctor said the fever turned and he could fetch you through. Yes, a deal has happened to make this old house dear. Christenings, funerals, weddings. What haven't we had here? Not a log in this building but its memories has got, and not a nail in this old floor but touches a tender spot. Out of the old house, Nancy, moved up into the new. All the hurry and worry is just as good as through. But I tell you a thing right here that I ain't ashamed to say. There's precious things in this old house we can never take away. Here the old house will stand, but not as it stood before. Winds will whistle through it and rains will flood the floor. And over the hearth, once blazing, the snowdrifts oft will pile. And the old thing will seem to be a morning all the while. Fare you well, old house. You're not that can feel or see, but you seem like a human being, a dear old friend to me. And we will never have a better home, if my opinion stands, until we commence a keeping house in the house not made with hands. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 of Farm Ballads. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kim Gibbs. Farm Ballads by Will Carlton. Chapter 7 Over the Hill to the Poor House. Over the Hill to the Poor House, I'm trudging my weary way. I, a woman of seventy, and only a trifle gray. I, who am smart and chipper, for all the years I've told, as many another woman that's only half as old. Over the hill to the poorhouse, I can't quite make it clear. Over the hill to the poorhouse, it seems so horrid queer. Many a step I've taken, a toiling to and fro, but this is a sort of journey I never thought to go. What is the use of heaping on me a pauper's shame? Am I lazy or crazy? Am I blind or lame? True, I am not so supple, nor yet so awful stout, but charity ain't no favor if one can live without. I am willing and anxious and ready any day to work for a decent living and pay my honest way. For I can earn my victuals, and more too, I'll be bound, if anybody only is willing to have me round. Once I was young and handsome, I was upon my soul. Once my cheeks was roses, my eyes as black as coal. And I can't remember in them days of hearing people say, for any kind of a reason, that I was in their way. Tain't no use of boasting or talking over free, but many a house and home was open then to me. Many a handsome offer I had from likely men, and nobody ever hinted that I was a burden then. And when to John I was married, sure he was good and smart, but he and all the neighbors would own I'd done my part. For life was all before me, and I was young and strong, and I worked the best that I could in trying to get along. And so we worked together, and life was hard but gay with now and then a baby for to cheer us on our way. Till we had half a dozen, and all growed clean and neat, and went to school like others, and had enough to eat. So we worked for the children, and raised em every one, worked for em summer and winter, just as we ought to have done. Only perhaps we humored em, which some good folks condemn, but every couple's children's a heap the best to them. Strange how much we think of our blessed little ones. I'd have died for my daughters. I'd have died for my sons. And God, he made that rule of love. But when we're old and gray, I've noticed it sometimes somehow fails to work the other way. Strange, another thing, when our boys and girls was grown, and when, except in Charlie, they'd left us there alone. When John, he nearer and nearer come, and dearer seemed to be, the Lord of hosts, he come one day, and took him away from me. Still, I was bound to struggle, 
and never to cringe or fall. Still, I worked for Charlie, for Charlie was now my all. And Charlie was pretty good to me, with scarce a word or frown, till at last he went to courtin' and brought a wife from town. She was somewhat dressy and hadn't a pleasant smile. She was quite conceity and carried a heap of style. But if ever I tried to be friends, I did it with her, I know. But she was hard and proud, and I couldn't make it go. She had an education, and that was good for her. But when she twitted me on mine, "'Twas carrying things too far. "'And I told her once, for company, "'and it almost made her sick, "'that I never swallowed a grammar "'or et arithmetic. "'So t'was only a few days "'before the thing was done. "'They was a family of themselves, "'and I another one. "'And a very little cottage "'one family will do, "'but I never have seen a house "'that was big enough for two and I never could speak to suit her, never could please her eye, and it made me independent, and then I didn't try. But I was terribly staggered, and felt it like a blow, when Charlie turned again me, and told me I could go. I went to live with Susan, but Susan's house was small, and she was always a hintin' how snug it was for us all, and what with her husband's sisters, and what with children three, "'Twas easy to discover that there wasn't room for me. "'And then I went to Thomas, the oldest son I've got, "'for Thomas's buildings had cover the half of an acre lot. "'But all the children was on me. "'I couldn't stand their sauce. "'And Thomas said I needn't think I was coming there to boss. "'And then I wrote to Rebecca, my girl who lives out west, "'and to Isaac, not far from her, some twenty miles at best. And one of them said twas too warm there for any one so old, and t'other had an opinion the climate was too cold. So they have shirked and slighted me and shifted me about. So they have well nigh soured me and wore my old heart out. But still, I've borne up pretty well and wasn't much put down, till Charlie went to the poor master and put me on the town. Over the hill to the poorhouse, my children, dear, good-bye. Many a night I've watched you when only God was nigh. And God'll judge between us, but I will always pray that you shall never suffer the half I do today. End of chapter 7「Over the Hill from the Poor House by Will Carleton Read for LibriVox.org by Robert Robinson. I, who was always counted, they say, rather a bad stick in any way, splintered all over with dodges and tricks, known as the worst of the deacon six. I, the truant, saucy and bold, the one black sheep in my father's fold. Once on a time, as the stories say, went over the hill on a wintry's day, over the hill to the poorhouse. Tom could save what twenty could earn. But given was something he'd ne'er would learn. Isaac could half of the scriptures speak, committed a hundred verses a week, never forgot and never slipped, but honor thy father and mother, he skipped. So, over the hill to the poorhouse. As for Susan, her heart was kind and good, what there was of it, mind. Nothing too big and nothing too nice, nothing she wouldn't sacrifice for one she loved, and that air one was herself, when all was said and done. And Charlie and Becca meant well, no doubt, but anyone could pull them about. And all our, our folks ranked well, you see, save one poor fellow, and that was me. And when, one dark and rainy night, a neighbor's horse went out of sight, they hitched on me as the guilty chap that carried one end of the halter strap. And I think, myself, that view of the case wasn't altogether out of place. My mother denied it, as mothers do, but I'm inclined to believe t'was true, though for me one thing might be said— that I, as well as the horse, was led. And the worst of whiskey spurred me on, or else the deed would have never been done. But the keenest grief I ever felt was when my mother beside me knelt, and cried and prayed till I melted down, as I wouldn't for half the horses in town. I kissed her fondly, then and there, and swore henceforth to be honest and square. 
I served my sentence, a bitter pill some fellow should take who never will, and then I decided to go out west, concluding t'would suit my health the best. Where, how I prospered, I could never tell, but fortune seemed to like me well. And somehow every vein I struck was always bubbling over with luck, and, better than that, I was steady and true, and put my good resolutions through. But I wrote to a trusty old neighbor, and said, You tell him, old fellow, that I am dead, and died a Christian, to a please him more than if I had lived the same before. But when this neighbor, he wrote to me, Your mother's in the poorhouse, says he. I had a resurrection straight away, and started for her that very day. And when I arrived where I was grown, I took good care that I shouldn't be known. But I bought the old cottage, through and through, of someone Charlie had sold it to, and held back neither work nor gold, to fix it up as it was of old. The same big fireplace, wide and high, flung up its cinders toward the sky. The old clock ticked on the corner shelf. I wound it and set it a-going myself. And if everything wasn't just the same, neither I nor money was to blame. Then, over the hill to the poorhouse. One blowing, blustering winter's day, with a team and cutter I started away. My fiery nags was as black as coal. They somewhat resembled that horse I stole. I hitched and entered the poorhouse door. A poor old woman was scrubbing the floor. She rose to her feet in great surprise and looked quite startled into my eyes. I saw the whole of her troubles trace in the lines that marred her dear old face. Mother, I shouted, your sorrows is done. You're adopted along your horse thief's son. Come over the hill from the poorhouse. She didn't faint. She knelt by my side and thanked the Lord till I fairly cried. And maybe our ride wasn't pleasant and gay, and maybe she wasn't wrapped up that day, and maybe our cottage wasn't warm and bright, and maybe it wasn't a pleasant sight to see her getting the evening tea and frequently stopping and kissing me, and maybe we didn't live happy for years, in spite of my brothers' and sisters' sneers, who often said, as I have heard, that they wouldn't own a prison bird. Though, they're getting over that, I guess, for all of them owe me more or less. But I've learned one thing, and it cheers a man, and always a doing the best he can. That whether, on the big book, a blot gets over a fellow's name or not, whenever he does a deed that's white, it's credited to him fair and right. And when you hear the great bugle's notes, and the Lord divides his sheep and goats, however they may settle my case, wherever they may fix my place, my good old Christian mother, you'll see, will be sure to stand right up for me, with Over the Hill from the Poor House. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Uncle Sammy by Will Carlton. Read for LibriVox.org by Russell Newton. Some men were born for great things, some were born for small. Some, it is not recorded why they were born at all, but Uncle Sammy was certain he had a legitimate call. Some were born with a talent, some with scrip and land, some with a spoon of silver, and some with a different brand. But Uncle Sammy came holding an argument in each hand. Arguments sprouted within him and twinked in his little eye. He lay and calmly debated when average babies cry, and seemed to be pondering gravely whether to live or to die. But prejudiced on that question he grew from day to day, and finally he concluded twas better for him to stay. And so, into life's discussion, he reasoned and reasoned his way. Through childhood, through youth, into manhood argued and argued he, and he married a simple maiden, though scarcely in love was she. But he reasoned the matter so clearly, she hardly could help but agree. And though at first she was blooming and the new firm started strong, and though Uncle Sammy loved her and tried to help her along, she faded away in silence, and twas evident something was wrong. Now Uncle Sammy was faithful and various remedies tried. He gave her the doctor's prescriptions and plenty of logic beside. But logic and medicine failed him, and so, one day, she died. He laid her away in the churchyard, so haggard and crushed and wan, and reared her a costly tombstone with all of her virtues on, and ought to have added, a victim to arguments pro and con. For many a year Uncle Sammy fired away at his logical forte, Discussion was his occupation and altercation his sport. He argued himself out of churches, he argued himself into court. 
but alas for his peace and quiet one day when he went it blind and followed his singular fancy and slighted his logical mind and married a ponderous widow that wasn't of the arguing kind her sentiments all were settled her habits were planted and grown her heart was a starved little creature that followed a will of her own and she raised a high hand with sammy and proceeded to play it alone then sammy he charged down upon her with all of his strength and his wit and many a dexterous encounter and many a fair shoulder hit but vain were his blows and his blowing he never could budge her a bit he laid down his premises round her he scraped at her with his saws he rained great facts upon her and read her the marriage laws but the harder he tried to convince her the harder and harder she was she brought home all her preachers as many as ever she could with sentiments terribly settled and appetites horribly good who sat with him long at his table and explained to him where he stood and sammy was not long in learning to follow the swing of her gown and came to be faithful in watching the phase of her smile and her frown and she with the heel of assertion soon tramped all his arguments down and so with his life aspirations thus suddenly brought to a check and so with the foot of his victor unceasingly pressing his neck he wrote on his face i'm a victim and drifted a logical wreck and farmers whom he had argued to corners tight and fast would wink at each other and chuckle and grin at him as he passed as to say my ambitious old fellow your whiffle trees straightened at last old uncle sammy one morning lay down on his comfortless bed and death and he had a discussion and death came out ahead and the fact that she failed to start him was only because he was dead the neighbors laid out their old neighbor with homely but tenderest art and some of the oldest ones faltered and tearfully stood apart for the crusty old man had often unguardedly shown them his heart but on his face an expression of quizzical study lay as if he were sounding the angel who traveled with him that day and laying the pipes down slyly for an argument on the way and one new-fashioned old lady felt called upon to suggest that the angel might take uncle sammy and give him a good night's rest and then introduce him to solomon and tell him to do his best end of poem this recording is in the public domain tom was going for a poet by will carlton read for LibriVox.org by abigail johnston the farmer discourses of his son tom was going for a poet and said he'd a poet be one of these long-haired fellers a feller hates to see what are these chaps forever fixin things cute and clever makin the world in general step long to tune and time and cuttin the earth into slices and saltin it down into rhyme poets are good for something so long as they stand the head but poetry's worth whatever it fetches in butter and bread and many a time i've said it it don't do a fellow credit to starve with a hole in his elbow and be considered a fool so after he's dead the young ones will speak his pieces in school and tom he had an opinion that shakespeare and all the rest with all their winter clothing couldn't make him a decent vest but that didn't ease my labors or help him among the neighbors who watched him from a distance and held his mind in doubt and wondered if tom wasn't shaky or knew what he was about tom went to sowin to sow a field of grain but half of that ear sowin was altogether in vain for he was always a stoppin and gems of poetry droppin and metaphors they be pleasant but much too thin to eat and germs of thought be handy but never grow up to wheat tom he went to mowin when broilin summer's day and spoke quite sweet concernin the smell of the new mowed hay but all of his useless chatter didn't go to help the matter or make the grief less searchin or the pain less hard to feel when he made a clip too sudden and sliced his brother's heel tom he went to drivin the heels and dales across but scanning the lines of his poetry he dropped the lines of his hoss the nag ran fleet and fleeter in quite a regular metre and when we got tom's leg set and had fixed him so he could speak he muttered that adventure would keep him a right in a week. Tom, he went to plowin and couldn't have done it worse. He sat down on the handles and went to spin in verse. He wrote it nice and pretty, an agricultural ditty. 
that all of his pesky measures didn't measure an acre more, nor his pints didn't turn a furrow that wasn't turned before. Tom, he went a courtin. She liked him, I suppose, but certain parts of courtin a feller must do in prose. He rhymed her each day a letter, but that didn't serve to get her. He waited so long she married another man from spite, and sent him word she'd done it, and not to forget to write. Tom at last got married. His wife was smart and stout, and she shoved up the window and slung his poetry out. And at each new poem's creation, she gave it circulation. And fast as he would write em, she seen to their puttin' forth, and sent him east and westward, and also south and north. To Tom he struck the opinion that poetry didn't pay, and turned the guts of his genius and fired him another way. He settled himself down steady, and is quite well off already, and all of his life is in verses with his wife the first and best, and ten or a dozen children to constitute the rest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Going Home Today by Will Carlton. Read for LibriVox.org by Betty B. Going Home Today. My business on the jury's done, the quibblin' all is through. I've watched the lawyers right and left and give my verdict true. I stuck so long unto my chair, I thought I would grow in. And if I do not know myself, they'll get me there again. But now the court's adjourned for good, and I have got my pay. I'm loose at last, and thank the Lord, I'm going home today. I've somehow felt uneasy like since first day I come down. It is an awkward game to play the gentleman in town, and this here Sunday suit of mine on Sunday rightly sets, but when I wear the stuff a week, it somehow galls and frets. I'd rather wear my homespun rig of pepper salt and gray. I'll have it on in half a jiff when I get home today i have no doubt my wife looked out as well as any one as well as any woman could to see that things was done for though melinda when i'm there won't set her foot outdoors she's very careful when i'm gone to tend to all the chores but nothing prospers half so well when i go off to stay and i will put things into shape when i get home to-day the morning that i come away we had a little bout i coolly took my hat and left before the show was out for what i said was not whereat she ought to take offence and she was always quick at words and ready to commence but then she's first one to give up when she's had her say and she will meet me with a kiss when i go home to-day my little boy i'll give em leave to match em if they can it's fun to see em strut about and try to be a man the gamest cheeriest little chap you'd ever want to see and then they laugh because i think the child resembles me the little rogue he goes for me like robbers for their prey he'll turn my pockets inside out when i get home to-day my little girl i can't contrive how it should happen thus that god could pick that sweet bouquet and fling it down to us my wife she says that handsome face will some day make a stir and then i laugh because she thinks the child resembles her she'll meet me halfway down the hill and kiss me any way and light my heart up with her smiles when i go home to-day if there's a heaven upon the earth a fellow knows it when he's been away from home a week and then gets back again if there's a heaven above the earth there often i'll be bound some homesick fellow meets his folks and hugs em all around but let my creed be right or wrong or be it as it may my heaven is just ahead of me. I'm going home today. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Out of the Fire by Will Carleton. Read for LibriVox.org by Will Dodd. As told in 1880. Year of 71, children. Middle of the fall. On one fearful night, children, we well nigh lost our all. True, it wasn't no great sum we had to lose that night. But when a little's all you got, it comes to a blessed sight. I was a mighty worker in them air difficult days. For work is a good investment, and almost always pays. But when ten years' hard labor went smoking into the air, I doubted all of the maxims, and felt that it wasn't fair. 
Up from the east we had traveled, with all our household wares, where we had long been working, a piece of land on shares. But how a fellow's to prosper without the rise of the land, for just two-thirds of nothing, I could never understand. Up from the east we had traveled, me and my folks alone, and quick we went to working, a piece of land of our own. Small was our backwoods quarters, and things looked mighty cheap, but everything we put in there, we put in there to keep. So with working and saving, we managed to get along, managed to make a living, and feel considerable strong. And things went smooth and happy, and fair as the average run, till everything went back on me in the fall of 71. First thing bothered and worried me was long o' my daughter Kate, rather a handsome creature, and folks all liked her gait, not so nice as them sham ones in yeller-covered books, but still there wasn't much discount on Catherine's ways and looks. And Catherine's smile was pleasant, and Catherine's temper good, and how she come to like Tom Smith I never understood, for she was a morning glory, as fair as you ever see, and Tom was a shag-bark hickory, as green as green could be. Like takes to like is a proverb that's nothing more than trash, and many times I've seen it all pulverized to smash. For folks in no way similar, I've noticed again and again, will often take to each other and stick together like sin. Next thing bothered and worried me was long of a terrible drought, and me and all of my neighbors was summat down in the mouth. And week after week the rain held off and things all pined and dried, and we drove the cattle miles to drink, and many of them died. And day after day went by us, so handsome and so bright, and never a drop of water came near us, day or night. And what with the neighbors grumbling, and what with my daily loss, I must own that somehow or other I was getting mighty cross. And on one Sunday evening, I was coming down the lane for meeting where our preacher had stuck and hung for rain. And various slants on heaven kept working in my mind, and the smoke from Sanders' fallow was making me almost blind. I opened the door kind of sudden, and there my Catherine sat, as cozy as a kitten, along with a friendly cat. And Tom was dreadful near her, his arm on the back of her chair, and looking as happy and cheerful as if there was rain to spare. Get out of this house in a minute, I cried with all my might. Get out while I'm a-talkin'. Tom's eyes showed a bit of fight, but he rose up stiff and surly and made me a civil bow and mogged along to the doorway with never a word of row. And I snapped up my wife quite surly when she asked me what I'd said, and I scolded Kate for crying and sent her upstairs to bed. And then I laid down for a purpose of getting a little sleep, and the wind outside was a howlin' and putting it in to keep. Twas half past three next morning, or maybe twas nearer four. The neighbors came yelling and pounding at my door. Get up, get up, they shouted. Get up, there's danger near. The woods are all a-burning. The wind's blowing it here. If ever it happens, children, that you get catched some time, with fire a-blowing towards you, as fast as fire can climb, you'll get up and get in a hurry, as fast as you can budge. It's a lively season of the year, or else I ain't no judge. Out of the dear old cabin, we tumbled fast as we could, smashed two-thirds of our dishes, and saved some four-foot wood. With smoke a-settling round us, and getting into our eyes, a fire a-roaring and roaring, and drowning all our cries. And just as the roof was smoking, and we hadn't long to wait, I say to my wife, now get out, and hustle you and Kate. And just as the roof was falling, my wife, she come to me with a face as white as a corpse's face. And where is Kate? says she. And the neighbors come running to me with faces black as a ground and shouted, where is Catherine? She's nowhere to be found. And this is all I remember till I found myself next day a lion in Sanders' cabin a mile and a half away. If ever you wake up, children, with something into your head concerning a handsome daughter that's lying still and dead, all scorched into coal-black cinders, perhaps you may not weep, but I rather think it'll happen. You'll wish you'd have kept asleep. And all I could say was, Catherine, oh, Catherine, come to me. And all I could think was, Catherine, and all that I could see was Sanders a-standing near to me, his finger into his eye, 
and my wife a-bending over me and telling me not to cry. When lo, Tom Smith he entered, his face lit up with grins, and Kate a-hanging on his arm as neat as a row of pins. And Tom looked glad but sheepish, and said, Excuse me, squire, but I loped with Kate and married her an hour before the fire. Well, children, I was shattered. "'Twas more than I could bear, and I up and went for Kate and Tom and hugged em then and there. And since that time the times have changed, and now they ain't so bad. And Catherine, she's your mother now, and Thomas Smith's your dad. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The New Church Organ by Will Carleton Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson They've got a brand new organ, Sue, for all their fuss and search. They've done just as they said they'd do, and fetched it into church. They're bound the critter shall be seen, and on the preacher's right, they've hoisted up their new machine in everybody's sight. They've got a chorister and a choir, again my voice and vote, for it was never my desire to praise the Lord by note. I've been a sister good and true for five and thirty year. I've done what seemed my part to do and prayed my duty clear. I've sung the hymns both slow and quick, just as the preacher read. And twice, when Deacon Tubbs was sick, I took the fork and led. And now their bold new-fangled ways is comin' all about, and I write in my latter days and fairly crowded out. Today the preacher, good old dear, with tears all in his eyes, read, I can read my title clear to mansions in the skies. I always liked that blessed hymn. I suppose I always will. It somehow gratifies my whim in good old Ortonville. But when that choir got up to sing, I couldn't catch a word. They sung the most doggonest thing a body ever heard. Some worldly chaps was standin' near, and when I see them grin, I bid farewell to every fear and boldly waded in. I thought I'd chased their tune along, and tried with all my might. But though my voice is good and strong, I couldn't steer it right. When they was high, then I was low, and also contrawise. And I too fast, or they too slow, to mansions in the skies. And after every verse you know, they play a little tune. I didn't understand, and so I started in too soon. I pitched it pretty midland high, I fetched a lusty tone, but oh, alas, I found that I was singing there alone. They laughed a little, I am told, but I had done my best, and not a wave of trouble rolled across my peaceful breast. And Sister Brown, I could but look, she sits right front of me, and never was no singing book, and never went to be. But then she always tried to do the best she could, she said. She understood the time right through, and kept it with her head. But when she tried this morning, oh, I had to laugh or cough. I kept her head a bobbin' so, and in almost came off. And Deacon Tubbs, he all broke down, as one might well suppose. He took one look at Sister Brown and meekly scratched his nose. He looked his hymn-book through and through and laid it on the seat, and when a pensive sigh he drew, and looked completely beat, and when they took another bout, he didn't even rise. He drawed his red bandanner out and wiped his weeping eyes. I've been a sister good and true for five and thirty year. I've done what seemed my part to do and prayed my duty clear, but death will stop my voice, I know, for he is on my track, and some day I to church will go and never more come back. And when the folks gets up to sing, whene'er that time shall be, I do not want no patent thing a squealing over me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Editor's Guests by Will Carleton. Read for LibriVox.org by Robert Robinson. The editor sat in his sanctum, his countenance furrowed with care, his mind at the bottom of business, his feet at the top of a chair. His chair arm and elbow supporting, his right hand upholding his head, 
his eyes on his dusty old table with different documents spread. There were thirty long pages from Howler, with underlined capitals topped, and a short disquisition from Growler, requesting his newspaper stopped. There were lyrics from Gusher the poet, concerning the sweet flowerets and zephyrs, and a stray gem from Plotter, the farmer, describing a couple of heifers. There were billets from beautiful maidens, and bills from a grocer or two, and his best leader hitched to a letter which inquired if he wrote it or who. There were raptures of praises from writers of the weekly mellifluous school, and one of his rival's last papers informing him he was a fool. There were several long resolutions with names telling whom they were by, canonizing some harmless old brother who had done nothing worse than to die. There were traps on that table to catch him, and serpents to sting and to smite him. There were gift enterprises to sell him, and bidders attempting to bite him. There were long staring ads from the city, and money with never a one, which added, please give this insertion and send in your bill when you're done. There were letters from organizations, their meetings, their wants, and their laws, which said, can you print this announcement for the good of our glorious cause? There were tickets inviting his presence to festivals, parties, and shows, wrapped in notes with, please give us a notice, demurely slipped in at the close. In short, as his eye took the table, and ran o'er its ink-spattered trash, there was nothing in it did not encounter, excepting perhaps it was cash. The editor dreamily pondered on several ponderous things, on different lines of action, on the pulling of different strings. Upon some equivocal doings, and some unequivocal duns, on how few of his numerous patrons were quietly prompt paying ones, on friends who subscribed just to help him, and wordly encouragement lent, and had given him plenty of counsel, but never had paid him a cent, on vinegar kind-hearted people were feeding him every hour, who saw not the work they were doing, but wondered that printers are sour. On several intelligent townsmen, whose kindness was so without stint that they kept an eye out on his business, and told him just what he should print. On men who had rendered him favors, and never pushed forward their claims, so long as the paper was crowded with locals containing their names. On various other small matters, sufficient his temper to royal, and finally contrived to be making the blood of an editor boil. And so one may see that his feelings could hardly be said to be smooth, and he needed some pleasant occurrence his ruffled emotions to soothe. He had it, for lo, on the threshold, a slow and reliable tread, and a farmer invaded the sanctum, and these are the words that he said. Good morning, sir, Mr. Printer. How is your body today? I'm glad you're at home, for you fellers is always running away. Your paper last week wasn't so spicy nor sharp as the one week before, but I suppose when the campaign is opened, you'll be whooping it up to em more. That feller that's printin' the smasher is going for you pretty smart, and our folks said this morning's at breakfast they thought he was getting the start, but I hushed em right up in a minute and said a good word for you. I told em I believed you was trying to do just as well as you knew, and I told em that someone was saying, and whoever twas it was so, that you can't expect much of no ma'am nor blame him for what he don't know. But, laying aside pleasure for business, I brought you my little boy Jim, and I thought I would see if you couldn't make an editor out of him. My family stock is increasing, while other folks seem to run short. I got a right smart of a family. It's one of the old-fashioned sort. There's Ichabod, Isaac, and Israel, a working away on the farm. They do about as much one good boy, and make things go off like a charm. There's Moses and Aaron, our sly ones, and slip like a couple of eels. But they're tolerable steady in one thing. They always get round to their meals. There's Peter, is busy inventin', though what he invents I can't see. And Joseph is studying medicine, and both of them boardin' with me. There's Abraham and Albert is married, each workin' my farm for myself. And Sam smashed his nose at a shootin', so he is laid on a shelf. The rest of the boys are all growin', except this little runt, which is Jim, and I thought that perhaps I'd be making an editor out of him. He ain't no great shakes for to labor, though I've labored with him a good deal, and give him some strappin' good arguments I know he couldn't help but to feel. But he's built out of second-growth timber, and nothing about him is big except in his appetite only, and there he's as good as a pig. I keep him a-carryin' luncheons, and fillin' and bringin' the jugs, 
and take him among the pertaters and set him to pickin the bugs and then there is things to be doin a helpin the women indoors there's churnin and washin of dishes and other descriptions of chores but he don't take to nothin but victuals and he'll never be much i'm afraid so i thought it would be a good notion to larn him the editor's trade his body's too small for a farmer his judgment is rather too slim but i thought we perhaps could be makin an editor out of him it ain't much to get up a paper it wouldn't take him long for to learn he could feed the machine i'm thinkin with a good strappin fellow to turn and things that was once hard in doin is easy enough now to do you just keep your eye on your machinery and crack your arrangements right through i used for to wonder at readin and where it was got up and how but tis most of it made by machinery i can see it all plain enough now and poetry too is constructed of machines of different designs each one with a gauge and a chopper to see to the length of the lines and i hear a new york clairvoyant is running one sleeker than grease and a rentin her heaven-born productions at a couple of dollars apiece and since the whole trade has growed easy twould be easy enough of a whim if you was agreed to be making an editor out of jim the editor sat in his sanctum and looked the old man in the eye then glanced at the grinning young hopeful and mournfully made his reply is your son a small unbound edition of moses and solomon both can he compass his spirit with meekness and strangle a natural oath can he leave all his wrongs to the future and carry his heart in his cheek can he do an hour's work in a minute and live on a sixpence a week can he courteously talk to an equal and browbeat an impudent dunce can he keep things in apple pie order and do half a dozen at once can he press all the springs of knowledge with quick and reliable touch and be sure that he knows how much to know and knows how to not know too much does he know how to spur up his virtue and put a check rein on his pride can he carry a gentleman's manners within a rhinoceros hide can he know all and do all and be all with cheerfulness courage and vim if so we perhaps can be making an editor out of him the farmer stood curiously listening while wonder his visage o'erspread and he said jim i guess we'll be a goin he's probably out of his head but lo on the rickety staircase another reliable tread and entered another old farmer and these are the words that he said good morning sir mr editor how is the folks today i owe you for next year's paper and i thought i'd come in and pay and jones is a-goin to take it and this is his money here i shut down on lending it to him i coaxed him to try it a year and here is a few little items that happened last week in our town i thought they'd look good for the paper so i just jotted them down and here is a basket of cherries my wife picked expressly for you and a small bunch of flowers from jenny she thought she must send something too you're doing the politics bully as all of our family agree you just keep your old goose quill a floppin and give em a good one for me and now you are a chuck full of business and i won't be taking your time i've things of my own i must tend to good day sir i believe i will climb the editor sat in his sanctum and brought down his fist with a thump god bless that old farmer he muttered he's a regular editor's trump and tis thus with our noble profession and thus it will ever be still there are some who appreciate its labors and some who perhaps never will but in the great time that is coming when loudly the trumpet shall sound and they who have labored and rested shall come from the quivering ground when they who have striven and suffered to teach and ennoble the race shall march at the front of the column each one in his god-given place as they pass through the gates of the city with proud and victorious tread the editor printer and devil will travel not far from the head end of poem this recording is in the public domain the house where we were wed by will carlton read for LibriVox.org by paul i hate i've been to the old farmhouse good wife where you and i were wed where the love was born to our two hearts that now lies cold and dead where a long-kept secret to you i told in the yellow beams of the moon and we forged our vows out of love's own gold to be broken so soon so soon 
I passed through all the old rooms, good wife. I wandered on and on. I followed the steps of a flitting ghost, the ghost of a love that is gone. And he led me out to the arbor, wife, where with myrtles I twined your hair. And he seated me down on the old stone step and left me musing there. The sun went down as it used to do and sunk in the sea of night. The two bright stars that we called ours came slowly unto my sight, but the one that was mine went under a cloud, went under a cloud alone. And the tear that I wouldn't have shed for the world fell down on the old grey stone. But there be words can ne'er be unsaid, and deeds can ne'er be undone, except perhaps in another world where life's once more begun, and maybe some time in the time to come, when a few more years are sped, we'll love again as we used to love in the house where we were wed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Our Army of the Dead by Will Carlton, read for LibriVox.org by Paul Ihe. By the edge of the Atlantic, where the waves of freedom roar, and the breezes of the ocean chant a requiem to the shore, on the nation's eastern hilltops, where its cornerstone was laid, on the mountains of New England, where our fathers toiled and prayed, mid old keystone's rugged riches, which the miners hand await, mid the never-ceasing commerce of the busy empire state with the country's love and honor on each brave devoted head is a band of noble heroes is our army of the dead on the lake encircled homestead of the thriving wolverine on the beauteous western prairies with their carpeting of green by the sweeping mississippi long out country's pride and boast on the rugged rocky mountains and the weird pacific coast in the listless sunny southland with its blossoms and its vines on the bracing northern hilltops and amid their murmuring pines over all our happy country over all our nation spread is a band of noble heroes is our army of the dead not with musket, not with sabre, and with glad heart beating fast, not with cannon that had thundered till the bloody war was past, not with voices that are shouting with the vim of victory's note, not with armor gaily glistening, and with flags that proudly float, not with air of martial vigor, nor with steady soldier tramp, come they grandly marching to us, for the boys are all in camp, with forgetfulness upon it, each within his earthly bed, waiting for his marching orders, is our army of the dead. Fast asleep, the boys are lying, in their low and narrow tents, and no battle cry can wake them, and no orders call them hence. And the yearnings of the mother, and the anguish of the wife, cannot with their magic presence call the soldier back to life. And the brother's manly sorrow and the father's mournful pride cannot give back to his country him who for his country died. They who for the trembling nation in its hour of trial bled lie in these its years of triumph with our army of the dead. When the years of earth are over and the cares of earth are done, when the reign of time has ended and eternity begun, when the thunders of omniscience on our wakened senses roll, and the sky above shall whiffer and be gathered like a stroll, when among the lofty mountains and across the mighty sea, the sublime celestial bugler shall ring out the reveal, then shall march with brightest laurels and with proud victorious tread to their station up in heaven, our grand army of the dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Apple Blossoms by Will Carlton. Read for LibriVox.org by Abigail Johnston. Underneath an apple tree sat a maiden and her lover, and the thoughts within her he yearned in silence to discover. Round them danced the sunbeams bright, green the grass lawn stretched before them, while the apple blossoms white hung in rich profusion o'er them. Not within her eyes he read, that would tell her mind unto him. Though their light, he after said, quivered swiftly through and through him, till at last his heart burst free from the prayer with which twas laden, and he said, When wilt thou be mine for evermore, fair maiden? When, said she, the breeze of May with white flakes our heads shall cover, I will be thy bridling gay, thou shalt be my husband-lover. 
How, said he, in sorrow bowed, can I hope of such hopeful weather? Breeze of May and winter's cloud do not often fly together. Quickly as the words he said, from the west a wind came sighing, and on each uncovered head sent the apple blossoms flying. Flakes of white, thou art mine, said he, sooner than thy wish or knowing. Nay, I heard the breeze, quoth she, when in yonder forest blowing. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Apples Growing by Will Carlton, read for LibriVox.org by Abigail Johnston. Underneath an apple tree sat a dame of comely seeming, with her work upon her knee, and her great eyes idly dreaming. O'er the harvest acres bright came her husband's din of reaping. Near to her an infant white through the tangled grass was creeping. On the branches long and high, and the great green apples growing, rested she her wandering eye, with a retrospective knowing. This, she said, the shelter is, where, when gay and raven-headed, I consented to be his, and our willing hearts were wedded. Laughing words and peals of mirth long are changed to grave endeavor. Sorrow's winds have swept to earth many a blossom hope forever. Thunderheads have hovered o'er, storms my path have chilled and shaded. Of the bloom my gay youth bore, some has fruited, more has faded. Quickly, and amid her sighs, through the grass her baby wrestled smiled on her its father's eyes, and unto her bosom nestled. And with sudden, joyous glee, half the wife and half the mother's, still the best is left, said she. I have learned to live for others. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 of Farm Ballads. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kim Gibbs Farm Ballads by Will Carlton Chapter 19, 1 and 2 If you to me be cold, or I be false to you, The world will go on, I think, just as it used to do. The clouds will flirt with the moon, the sun will kiss the sea, the wind to the trees will whisper and laugh at you and me. But the sun will not shine so bright, the clouds will not seem so white, to one as they will to two. So I think you had better be kind, and I had best be true, and let the old love go on, just as it used to do. If the whole of a page be read, if a book be finished through, Still the world may read on, I think, just as it used to do. For other lovers will con the pages that we have passed, and the treacherous gold of the binding will glitter unto the last. But lids have a lonely look, and one may not read the book. It opens only to two. So I think you had better be kind, and I had best be true, and let the reading go on just as it used to do. If we who have sailed together flit out of each other's view, the world will sail on, I think, just as it used to do. And we may reckon by stars that flash from different skies, and another of love's pirates may capture my lost prize. But ships long time together can better the tempest weather than any other two. So I think you had better be kind, and I had best be true, that we together may sail, just as we used to do. End of chapter 19 The Fading Flower by Will Carleton Read for LibriVox.org by Abigail Johnston There is a chillness in the air, a coldness in the smile of day, and e'en the sunbeam's crimson glare seems shaded with a tinge of gray. Weary of journeys to and fro, the sun low creeps adown the sky, and on the shivering earth below the long, cold shadows grimly lie. But there will fall a deeper shade, more chilling than the autumn's breath. There is a flower that yet must fade and yield its sweetness up to death. She sits upon the window seat, 
musing in mournful silence there while on her brow the sunbeams meet and dally with her golden hair she gazes on the sea of light that overflows the western skies till her great soul seems plumed for flight from out the window of her eyes hopes unfulfilled have vexed her breast sad smiles have checked the rising sigh until her weary heart confessed reluctantly that she must die and she has thought of all the ties the golden ties that bind her here of all that she has learned a prize of all that she has counted dear the joys of body heart and mind the pleasures that she loves so well the grasp of friendship warm and kind and love's delicious hallowed spell and she has wept that she must lie beneath the snow wreath stripped it deep with no fond mother standing nigh to watch her in her silent sleep and she has prayed if it might be within the reach of human skill and not averse to heaven that she might live a little longer still but earthly hope is gone and now comes in its place a brighter beam leaving upon her snowy brow the impress of a heavenly dream that she when her frail body yields and fades away to mortal eyes shall burst through heaven's eternal fields and bloom again in paradise end of poem this recording is in the public domain autumn days by will carleton read for LibriVox.org by david lawrence yellow mellow ripened days sheltered in a golden coating or the dreamy listless haze white and dainty cloudlets floating winking at the blushing trees and the sombre furrowed fallow smiling at the airy ease of the southward flying swallow sweet and smiling are thy ways beauteous golden autumn days shivering quivering tearful days fretfully and sadly weeping dreading still with anxious gaze icy fetters round thee creeping o'er the cheerless withered plain woefully and hoarsely calling pelting hail and drenching rain on thy scanty vestments falling sad and mournful are thy ways grieving wailing autumn days end of poem this recording is in the public domain death doomed by will carleton read for librivox dot org by tavarish they're taking me to the gallows mother they mean to hang me high they're going to gather round me there and watch me till i die all earthly joy has vanished now and gone each mortal hope they'll draw a cap across my eyes and round my neck a rope the crazy mob will shout and groan the priest will read a prayer the drop will fall beneath my feet and leave me in the air they think i murdered alan bain for so the judge has said and they'll hang me to the gallows mother hang me till i'm dead the grass that grows in yonder meadow the lambs that skip and play the pebbled brook behind the orchard that laughs upon its way the flowers that bloom in the dear old garden the birds that sing and fly are clear and pure of human blood and mother so am i by father's grave on yonder hill his name without a stain i ne'er had malice in my heart or murdered alan bain but twelve good men have found me guilty for so the judge has said and they'll hang me to the gallows mother hang me till i'm dead the air is fresh and bracing mother the sun shines bright and high it is a pleasant day to live a gloomy one to die it is a bright and glorious day the joys of earth to grasp it is a sad and wretched one to strangle choke and gasp but let them damp my lofty spirit or cow me if they can 
they send me like a rogue to death i'll meet it like a man for i never murdered alan bain but so the judge has said and they'll hang me to the gallows mother hang me till i'm dead poor little sister bell will weep and kiss me as i lie but kiss her twice and thrice for me and tell her not to cry tell her to weave a bright gay garland and crown me as of yore then plant a lily upon my grave and think of me no more and tell that maiden whose love i sought that i was faithful yet but i must lie in a felon's grave and she had best forget my memory is stained forever for so the judge has said and they'll hang me to the gallows mother hang me till i'm dead lay me not down by my father's side for once i mind he said no child that stained his spotless name should share his mortal bed old friends would look beyond his grave to my dishonored one and hide the virtues of the sire behind the recreant sun and i can fancy if there my corpse its fettered limbs should lay his frowning skull and crumbling bones would shrink from me away but i swear to god i am innocent and never blood have shed and they'll hang me to the gallows mother hang me till i'm dead lay me in my coffin mother as you've sometimes seen me rest one of my arms beneath my head the other on my breast place my bible upon my heart nay mother do not weep and kiss me as in happier days you kissed me when asleep and for the rest for form or right but little do i reck but cover up that cursed stain the black mark on my neck and pray to god for his great mercy on my devoted head for they'll hang me to the gallows mother hang me till i'm dead but hark i hear a mighty murmur among the jostling crowd a cry a shout a roar of voices it echoes long and loud there dashes a horseman with foaming steed and tightly gathered rein he sits erect he waves his hand good heaven tis alan bane the lost is found the dead alive my safety is achieved for he waves his hand again and shouts the prisoner is reprieved now mother praise the god you love and raise your drooping head for the murderer's gallows black and grim is cheated of its dead end of poem this recording is in the public domain Up the Line by Will Carleton. Read for LibriVox.org by David Lawrence. Through winding storm and clouds of night, we swiftly pushed our restless flight. With thundering hoof and warning neigh, we urged our steed upon his way up the line. Afar a lofty headlight gleamed, afar the whistle shrieked and screamed, and glistening bright and rising high our flakes of fire bestrewed the sky up the line adown the long complaining track our wheels a message hurried back and quivering through the rails ahead went news of our restless tread up the line the trees gave back our din and shout and flung their shadow arms about and shivering in their coats of gray they heard us roaring far away 
up the line the wailing storm came on apace and dashed its tears into our face but steadily still we pierced it through and cut the sweeping wind in two up the line the rattling rush across the ridge a thunder peal beneath the bridge and valley and hill and sober plain re-echoed our triumphant strain up the line and when the eastern streaks of gray bespoke the dawn of coming day we halted our steed his journey o'er and urged his giant form no more up the line end of poem this recording is in the public domain How We Kept the Day by Will Carlton Read for LibriVox.org by Tavarish The great procession came up the street With clatter of hoofs and tramp of feet There was General Jones to guide the van And Corporal Jinx, his right-hand man And each was riding his high horse And each had epaulets, of course And each had a sash of the bloodiest red and each had a shako on his head, and each had a sword by his left side, and each had his moustache newly dyed. And that was the way we kept the day, the great, the grand, the glorious day that gave us hooray, 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 with a battle or two, the histories say, our national independence. The great procession came up the street, with loud de capo and brazen repeat, there was Hans, the leader, a Teuton born, a sharp who worried the E flat horn, and Bariton Jake and Alto Mike, who never played anything twice alike, and tenor Tom of conservative mind, who always came out an out behind, and Dick, whose tuba was seldom dumb and bob who punished the big bass drum and when they stopped a minute to rest the martial band discoursed its best the ponderous drum and the pointed fife proceeded to roll and shriek for life and bonaparte crossed the rhine anon and the girl i left behind me came on and that was the way the bands did play on the loud high-toned harmonious day that gave us hooray 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 with some music of bullets our sires would say our glorious independence the great procession came up the street with a wagon of virgins sour and sweet each bearing the bloom of recent date each misrepresenting a single state there was California, pious and prim, and Louisiana humming a hymn. The Texas lass was the smallest one. Rhode Island weighed the tenth of a ton. The Empire State was pure as a pearl, and Massachusetts a modest girl. Vermont was red as the blush of a rose, and the goddess sported a turn-up nose, and looked free sylph where she painfully sat the worlds she would give to be out of that and in this way the maidens gay flashed up the street on the beautiful day that gave us hooray 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 with some sacrifices our mothers would say our glorious independence the great procession came up the street with firemen uniformed flashily neat there was Tubbs the foreman, with voice like five, the happiest, proudest man alive, with a trumpet half as long as a gun, which he used for the glory of number one. There was Nubs, who had climbed a ladder high and saved a dog that was left to die. There was Cubs, who had dressed in black and blue, the eye of the foreman of number two and each marched on with steady stride and each had a look of fiery pride and each glanced slyly round with a whim that all of the girls were looking at him 
and that was the way with grand display they marched through the blaze of the glowing day that gave us hooray 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 with some hot fighting our fathers would say our glorious independence the eager orator took the stand in the cause of our great and happy land he aired his own political views he told us all of the latest news how the boston folks one night took tea their grounds for steeping it in the sea what a heap of britons our fathers did kill at the little skirmish of bunker hill he put us all in anxious doubt as to how that matter was coming out and when at last he had fought us through to the bloodless year of eighty two twas the fervent hope of every one that he as well as the war was done but he continued to painfully soar for something less than a century more until at last he had fairly begun the wars of eighteen sixty one and never rested till neath the tree that shadowed the glory of robert lee and then he inquired with martial frown americans must we go down and as an answer from heaven were sent the stand gave way and down he went a singer or two beneath him did drop a big fat alderman fell atop and that was the way our orator lay till we fished him out on the eloquent day that gave us hooray 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 with a clash of arms pat henry would say our wordy independence the marshal his hungry compatriots led where freedom's vines were thickly spread with all that man or woman could eat from crisp to sticky from sour to sweet there were chickens that scarce had learned to crow and veteran roosters of long ago there was one old turkey huge and fierce that was hatched in the days of president pierce of which at last with an ominous groan the parson essayed to swallow a bone and it took three sinners plucky and stout to grapple the evil and bring it out and still the dinner went merrily on and james and lucy and hannah and john kept winking their eyes and smacking their lips and passing the eatables into eclipse and that was the way the grand array of victuals vanished on that day that gave us hooray 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 with some starvation the records say our well-fed independence the people went home through the sultry night in a murky mood and a pitiful plight not more had the rockets sticks gone down than the spirits of them who had been to town not more did the fire balloon collapse than the pride of them who had known mishaps there were feathers ruffled and tempers roiled and several brand-new dresses spoiled there were hearts that ached from envy's thorns and feet that twinged with trampled corns there were joys proved empty through and through and several purses empty too and some reeled homeward muddled and late who hadn't taken their glory straight and some were fated to lodge that night in the city lock-up snug and tight and that was the way the deuce was to pay as it always is at the close of the day that gave us hooray 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 with some restrictions the fault finders say that which please god we will keep for a our national independence end of poem this recording is in the public domain 
End of Farm Ballads by Will Carlton.